So I woke up this morning and I thought, wow, 14 years we've been doing this here in the city of Lynn. And I thought, and I had to pinch myself and I said, gee, Pam Freeman, we've been doing this for a long time. And then I thought about each and every one of my partners here today that I just want to thank you immensely. Thank you for coming out today. You know, my story goes on. Um, I came into this world 15 years ago because I was so interested in foster care and I wanted to give back. And at that time, I was wor working for T. Berry Brazelton. And I was very connected to him and he was very connected to me. But I had a calling and all the work that he did and all those edits on his Touch Points book, I wanted more. And I wanted to give back to a community that I was born and raised in. And so my husband and I went through that MAP training. It was about four months long at the Lawrence Technical um, High School. And we sat there, and at that time, we were couples. We were African-American couples. There were Asian couples. There were same-sex couples. There were Caucasian couples. There were no Spanish couples in that session that we had gone to. But we had realized that there were about 65% of children of color in foster care at that time. And it goes back to a quote that Bruce Willis says about being a hero, taking the time to think about foster care and adoption and giving back to your community. And so here I am 15 years later, and I could do so many things, but I'm so entrenched in the work of not only strengthening my own family, but strengthening every family in the city of Lynn, and that's my commitment. Again, I want to thank you with a warm welcome and a very pleasant introduction to all of you who have come out here today for our 14th Annual Child Abuse Prevention. I want to start because I think in the 14 years, we always do things backwards. And I want to start before we do the opening and thanking so many people that have been here to help me get to this place. You know, Community Connections um, started out at the Ford School in 1995. And then I took over in 2000. And I took over as a solo. And I could never do this work alone. And behind the scenes, you see a very young woman who's determined, who has learned to grow the thickest skin at 22, coming out of high school, you know, entering into you know, college, trying to think about what she wants to do. And I just want to thank, from the top to the bottom to the middle of my heart, Ms. Shin Shindice, Shanice Andino. And then I would like to thank, you know, other staff members um, that also help make Community Connections a whole. Um, I would like to start off by introducing my intern who um, got the world of the Pam Freeman, and that's Miss Jenny Marcelin. <laughs> my office staff, again, I couldn't do without it. Um, and could you stand, please? Um, Lewis Eaton. Again, um, you see all of these donations. Miss Tina Lloyd. Where's Tina? And then the person that's on the phone, and she's probably the one that's driving you crazy, Miss Winnie Payne. And then behind it all, it's my steering committee that pushes me, that I push them, that I probably push that envelope so far sometimes, but at the end they understand why. And I will stop by honoring my chair, and that's Ms. Loretta Cuffel Donnell, who's not with us today. She's um, not been feeling very well. And um, our co-chair. The glue, Mr. Harry McCabe. Uh, 
I'm going to stop by our newcomers because um, we have a lot of seasoned people on our board. Um, that's Mr. Brian Castellano. Castellano. <laughs> Miss Mary Ellen O'Connor. Conley. <laughs> Attorney Michael Satterwhite. <laughs> Miss Mia Shandell. Miss Lisa Conley. Miss Danielle Barrett. You know, I, I saved the three for the last because they have been here for the duration of the coalition. And I'm going to start off with the mother, the one who pushes us, the one who you know, has, has, has really supported this initiative for the 14 years. And I say this with an honorable thank you, Ms. Donna Coppola. Um, you, you, want, you want to talk about the rebel of the group, um, but really has been there with us, um, supported us through a lot of our missions, and that's Ms. Kim Hudson. And not, last but not least, one of the longest standing members that has been with us from the very start, um, I think from the very beginning, and that goes to uh, Ms. Brenda Womack. Thank you so much. So that concludes um, the thank you and the people who have really supported us. I just want to share with you one other thing before we begin. The donations on the table, the centerpieces, they were donated from Selby the Florist in Lynn, Flowers by Lorraine in Lynn, Dar Flowers by Darlene in Salem, Mass, Flower House from Marblehead, Maria's Flowers and Gifts from Peabody, and most importantly, the beautiful centerpiece from Mr. Tony the Florist. I'm sorry, um, let me make that correction. Mr. Selby, the florist. <laughs> the food donations this year totaled up to $720. And the donators are Bennett Street Tire, The Porthole Pub, Saugus Autocraft, Lynn Lawnmower and Snow, Lawn, um, Landry's Rental, Western Ave Auto Body, Hour, Hourglass Cleaning, Goodrich Funeral Home, Zimmons, um, Caracos Auto Repair, Stacy's Home Day Care, Caribbean Auto Body and Mechanic, Diana's Repair, VIP Auto Audio Repair. So as we sit here today, and I invite Pastor Nelson up to the, the podium, this is what we can do in a community. If we support, if we really look at a mission and see how important it is, we can come together. You know, budget is always an issue for all of us, but at the end of the day, the donors of this community are our partners who put this breakfast together. Thank you very much. I would li now like to pleasantly introduce to you Pastor Nelson from Washington Street Baptist Church. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, God who is our creator, thereby making us all family, we come thankful for the children in our midst, your children, and for all the potential they represent. We come concerned that children grow up and fulfill the potential you have given them and that their growth not be stunted by hardship. We pray for parents everywhere that you give them the patience, wisdom, and understanding to raise children who won't have to recover from their childhoods. And if families need to be separated, we pray for more loving and compassionate foster homes in which children can heal and grow. 
Help us to do all that we can to protect and nurture young lives for their sake and the sake of our world. Bless our time together and bless this food. Amen. The coalition begins and it ends with parents. And I would like to invite our star parent coalition member that has succeeded through so many trials and tribulation, and that's Miss Lisa Hall. Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to take a moment and thank all of you for being here and sharing in this experience. Um, I'm going to tell you a little about me. I grew up in this city, and I, I didn't grow up the right way. I wasn't raised properly. I had a child very young. I didn't know how to take care of her. I had another one. Needless to say, by the time I was 35 years old, I had four children. I thought I knew everything. But my fourth child, he was autistic. So I reached out for help, and I couldn't get it from anyone. Like, I begged for help. I ended up entering the parenting program, and that was not a coincidence. God put me in that program for a reason. I was able to identify my parenting shortcomings. I could own them, and I could heal, and I could begin to nurture and love my children the way they deserve. My children now know every day on a daily basis that they are loved, that they are protected, and that mom is the boss, and that isn't going to change. <laughs> and the reason that is is because if they don't see me, doing the right thing, they're not going to. I was taught to teach my children how to be the parent I couldn't be. I went through the first 15 weeks, and I needed more. I wanted more information. I didn't even think I needed to be there to begin with. But the staff and the information and everything that I received from this program has changed my life and my kids' life so much. And it was not easy, because I have older kids and younger kids. So we get older ones that are like, oh, we know mom hasn't had this strict rule. Or... So when I came home one day and was like, these are the rules, they didn't think I was going to stick to it. But I had made a promise to myself that I was no longer going to start something I wasn't willing to finish completely. And... Uh, you, you, you can never finish learning how to parent, and you can never get enough information. I learned more information in this program on how to be a parent than I did earning two associate degrees in, in mental health and also human services. But I got parenting from this program. My children and me have a family today. We sit down consistently. We have structure. We have discipline. And most of all, we are a family. And I couldn't do that and wouldn't have been able to do it without having the strength of Pam's knowledge, the staff. That meant so much to me when they noticed things that I had anxieties about, or that they took interest because Lisa was asking for help. At first, I walked in there, and I thought I was in the wrong place because my son's autistic. So I thought I just needed to learn how to take care of an autistic child. What I realized was that I needed to take care of all of my children equally. And today, I can say I can do that. And today, I can say I needed help. I am not ashamed of it. I am proud of it. It has empowered me. And this program has allowed me to become the mother that I was not for many years to my children. I love you, Pam, for everything you've done. And I don't think I could ever go anywhere else with my children 
than where I ended up now without this program. I love you more. I would like to proudly honor and respect our mayor of the city of Lynn, Ms. Mrs. Judy Flanagan Kennedy. Thank you, Pam, and thank you to the Lynn Community Connections Coalition for hosting the event this morning. Um, I never know what I'm going to talk about until it's about five minutes before it's time to get up. Uh, and I knew the general topic of today. And um, I was not asked to speak from this perspective, but it just seems like the most fitting perspective for me to present to you today. From the time I was six until about the time I was nine, I was a foster sister. My parents were foster parents, um, first to Carol, then to Eleanor, and then to Donna. Uh, Eleanor and Donna were, were pretty short-term sisters to me, but Carol and I spent a couple of years together. Carol had a sister named Susan, and Susan lived up in Maine, and I never understood why we had to drive all the way to Maine to see her sister, but um, obviously my parents thought it was very important that the siblings be able to continue to have contact with one another even though they were separated. And as a kid, you don't really know why you have this new sibling coming into your life. Um, and Carol would talk to me sometimes. My mother and father would never ever say why Carol was with us. Uh, but she would tell me th that um, her mother and father used to chase each other around with knives. And I thought, I, I just couldn't imagine my parents doing something like that to one another. And um, even as a kid, you realize that that girl could not have stayed in the situation that she was in. And, uh, you know, frankly, for the most part, I just thought it was cool that I got another sister and other people didn't get another sister the way I had. Um, but as I grew older, it made me appreciate the care that my parents had, not only for their biological children, but for the foster children that, that came into the house as well. And I'll never forget the day that we brought Carol back to Westwood. Her, I'm glad that her parents were able to resolve their problems and were able to have their children back, but that was taking a sister away from me. And, and um, it's hard to put into words when you're nine years old because my parents never made any pretense about it, that Carol was going to stay with us for a while and that was going to be that. Um, so I knew she was not going to be a permanent part of the household but that didn't mean she didn't have to be a permanent part of my life. Um, we did lose touch through some of those years in our 20s and 30s, but I caught up with her through a neighbor of a friend who happened to work with her at the phone company, and sure enough, we did a little checking out, and it was the same Carol, and um, she's doing well. And I can't tell you how much that made my day when I heard that she was... She was okay, and she was still okay, and had a job, and, and was happy. Um, and I guess my parents never really got that out of their system, because after, um, I, I was a typical bratty nine-year-old kid, how come Jimmy gets his own room, and I have to share mine with sisters all the time? You know, and, and I don't know if that was the reason why my parents finally ended the foster care, um, foster parenting duties, or if it was... Um, just that it was time to move on to something else. But after that, my mother did home daycare through uh, Catholic Charities for, I think, 28 years. She had 217 children come through our household. She loved each of them as if they were her children and in later years as if they were her grandchildren. And I can tell you, as recently as Saturday, I was at the Cambodian Festival on the commons and a woman came up to me and she said, I don't know if you remember me, my name is Sue and my daughter Erin was cared for, your, 
for, um, in her early years by your mother. And I remember those kids. I, I immediately blurted out Erin's last name, and she said, I can't believe you remember. And I said, my mother has photo albums, upon photo album, of all of these kids. And um, they, they are now getting in touch with her on Facebook. So I guess uh, the message I would leave everybody with today, if I could, is that you can make a permanent difference in a child's life. Even if that foster parenting relationship ends, that doesn't mean the, per the personal relationship ends. And in fact, um, I can tell you again, from a foster sister's point of view, it has its many, many rewards. And any of you who are even thinking about going into foster care, I most certainly would encourage it. And I, again, welcome all of you on behalf of the city, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. I just have to share a funny story. Out of those 200 and how many children? 17. Um, my two oldest children were one of those, two, two of those 217 children. And one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> And I just want to let you know that um, Judy's mother, Rita, what we looked at as a mother, she was a second mother figure to us. So, you know, I'll always be grateful and thank you. Um, moving right along, um, is Michelle? Um, we were scheduled to have a representative from uh, Governor Baker office but I'm not sure if she's able to has able, you know able to join us um, I'd like to um, move on um, and as we all know I think a special woman to me has been a mentor since um, she's came into Lynn Public Schools and someone that I could pick up the phone and say you know I'm struggling I have a problem with and not someone that I don't think would ever not return my call and I just want to proudly invite our superintendent of schools, Dr. Kathy White. Thank you very much, Pam. Um, I, I cannot congratulate you and your team enough for the work you do in the Lynn Public Schools and um, for the children of the Lynn Public Schools and Lisa, um, where are you? That was tremendous. How really a wonderful story. Wonderful. Research confirms that child abuse and neglect negatively, negatively impact a student's long-term academic performance, their social, emotional well-being, their interpersonal abilities, and in the long term, unfortunately, their employment outcomes. And I know today um, we hear so many positive role models and. Um, at any point in time, intervention and prevention helps a child at any point in time. It makes the whole difference in their lives. And certainly we work, we try to work with all of the organizations in the city. We have now put on a whole team of social workers. They service every one of our schools and it's the attempt to stop child abuse, stop neglect, get positive role models because it makes a difference. And um, I'm just so proud to be here among all of you hardworking people and um, for the benefit of all the children in Lynn. So I support and applaud your efforts and I thank you very, very much, Pam, for having me here today. I remember when I started out with Lynn Community Connections 15 years ago, and one of the first people that was really instrumental in the work that we were doing was Lynn Community Health Center. And um, it was a lot of trying to get us to be focused on an area and, um, and really look at health and wellness of children in the community. And I remember those ba days back then. And I appreciate it now. I, I think I struggled with it in the beginning, but I appreciate it so much now. It's, 
that, that slogan, branching out and reaching deeper. And I would just like to invite the Executive Director of Lynn Community Health Center, Ms. Laurie Abrams. Barry. Well, thank you. Um, is this working? You can, I have a loud voice anyway. So. <laughs> Um, thank you for um, inviting me here. It's really um, impressive uh, to me to see the work that the Lynn Community Co um, Connections has been doing um, on behalf of, of families in Lynn. At the Lynn Community Health Center, we see many of you, we see many of your clients, um, and we work very hard to try to improve people's health and especially um, the health of young families and, and uh, children. But it's so much more than what a community health center uh, can do. We're very good at providing uh, medical care. We're very good at providing behavioral health care, dentistry, eye care. But the kind of work that um, the, the Lynn Community Connections Coalition does is so much deeper and, and is um, so much more impactful in individual families like Lisa's. I, I, it was such a wonderful story. We hear stories about this all the time and about the work that many of you do in your agencies. Um, but we also see way too often at the health center um, kids who are suffering from trauma. Um, so many of the children that come to uh, Lynn are coming from war-torn countries where they have seen things that would um, make any of us um, completely frightened. So the violence that, is, um, that we see in families sometimes, the violence that children have been exposed to um, in other countries, this is so much a part of what we're dealing with uh, when people come to the Lynn Community Health Center for care. What we really appreciate in Lynn is a kind of a unique um, collaboration between all the agencies. The health center is blessed to have really strong relationships with the city, with the school department, with many of you in the audience um, who are doing incredible work uh, with children in, in Lynn. Uh, it's really quite an amazing um, city in that respect. We are all a community coalition and I think that's what uh, especially uh, is appreciated by our doctors and nurses and dentists and uh, mental health counselors. I don't know of another community health center that has clinics in 12 public schools. We do. Uh, that kind of collaboration with the school department, you just don't see that in, in most communities or the work that we do with the health department under the direction of the mayor. Um, that close connection with uh, all the work that's done on food and fitness and trying to make a healthier community in so many different ways. Um, but working with young families, to me, that are suffering is really um, uh, the highest calling. And so I, I want to just uh, say how much I appreciate the work that you do, Pam, and your staff, and, um, and everyone. So thank you for letting me speak. And moving li right along, we're on schedule. Um, I, I would like to um, just say a few words about the next guest speaker um, that goes back, that's um, also part of the glue from Community Connections in the very beginning stages of Community Connections. And um, it's almost like she, she kind of weaves in and weaves out, um, but, but never goes away totally. Um, ha, ha, has been a mentor to me in so many ways. Um, I'm not sure if she realizes that, but she has been a mentor. And I'd like to invite Ms. Michelle Fira. She's the Area Program Director from Lynn DCF. Okay, so good morning. Um, so I was not originally your speaker. <laughs> um, I think the original speaker might have been Linda Spears and maybe even Charlie Baker, I think you had hoped to get. But unfortunately, I believe they were both invited 
Can everybody hear me? Uh, both invited to participate in a sexual abuse trauma panel um, or some type of um, like a blue ribbon commission of some sort. Uh, at least that's what I'm told. And then I think the next person that was asked to speak was Jack Doyle, who's the director of area for the Lynn DCF office. Many of you know him very well. Um, and he was subpoenaed to court this morning. <laughs> so I think I'd actually rather be here than in court. Uh, and I don't think it's Lynn court. I think it's Salem. So, <laughs> so you're off the hook, Ed. And <laughs> Pat. So thank you uh, for having the department represented this morning. I really appreciate it, and I'm sorry that I'm your third choice. Um, but I am the lucky one who gets to be here. Um, truly, um, like I said, I believe I made out in the deal. Um, and I kind of did put this together this morning, so I am a little nervous. Uh, two reasons, one last minute, and at the end I'll explain the other reason why I'm a little nervous. Um, but I have recently returned to the department. I feel very blessed to be back in Lynn. Um, I was in the private sector for 14 years. I was over at Leahy Health and Education Services, Northeast Behavioral Health. I'm not quite sure what they're called anymore. Um, but they've gone through a lot of transition, and I uh, was truly um, blessed to have been there for 14 years. Um, and running their residential services. And then uh, for the last year, Ray Pillage and Jack Doyle, Ray Pillage is the regional director at DCF, um, and Jack have both been advocating for me to come back to the department because it really truly is um, my uh, passion and my desire. Um, and then when the position opened up in Lynn, I felt I had to come home. Um, I had started my career in Beverly, but quickly came over to the Lynn office supporting them um, and felt like the Lynn community really was a place that I belonged. So our focus this morning is on child abuse prevention. Well, when you think, think of the department, you think, hmm, it's not always prevention, right? Because once we get involved, there has already been an event that has occurred. Um, however, uh, the department is a partner in the prevention, right, um, in many ways, I believe, either before or after. Um, so our job as community members is to continue to fight in preventing the abuse or neglect from happening. As many of, of you have often heard, it takes a village. And in this case, I truly believe, and this is the one, one of the reasons why I came back to Lynn, that the village is Lynn. And I'm going to get a little teary, because I really do love this community. So the department's role is to be a protective agency helping to fight the battle of abuse and neglect. However, there are many examples of when de the department also provides preventative support. Um, our connection with Lynn Community Connections, Pam's program, and I was once a steering committee member, I think in the beginning, maybe. <laughs> we were still evolving. Um, and it's so wonderful to see how um, it's still present and is still uh, an important part of the community. And I remember back then when we were trying to get um, the nurturing program, excuse me, the nurturing program up and running. And it's so amazing to hear the stories that I hear, Lisa's story. And I have so many families that I have been working with in the last five months um, that I've been back um, who speak so highly of the nurturing program and how that program has made a significant difference in them getting their children back. Um, so I just think that that is quite a legacy for Pam and the city of Lynn. Um, so we also at the department provide in-home in intensive services when needed on top of those community-based services. So again, these are all preventative services to hopefully reunify families, keep families intact, and prevent that next event. Um, helping families access services in the community, um, in-home therapy, mentoring. These are all great services that have really helped develop a rich community for our families. The department also works to educate and support families around the educational system. I will tell you, I have been in many communities in the 20 years that I have been a service provider, and I have never, ever um, had the relationship that the Lynn community has with the Lynn schools. Um, you know, uh, they have an amazing uh, special ed department. Your special ed director is someone I hold dear to me. 
um, and the collaboration. I, I actually had several of my workers from Leahy and some of our workers at the um, DCF that left and went to the new initiative at the Lynn schools to become social workers in the Lynn schools. So that's unheard of to have, I think, what, 80? Is it how many social workers you have? Uh, I don't know if it's that many, but we have a lot. You <laughs> all I know is I think you hired 23 <laughs> over the summer, and some of those were my staff. So uh, <laughs> I, you're welcome. <laughs> So um, we also are working to support fathers and involve fathers more in the lives of their children. Um, many a days, 20 years ago, you know, a family would come before the department um, and the father wouldn't be present. And we didn't ask. We didn't ask where the father was. We didn't reach out to the father. And now we are mandated. But on top of that, um, we provide support groups for fathers. Um, the Salem DCF office has an active support group. Catholic Charities has an active support group and hopefully the Lynn DCF office is looking to build a support network for fathers. Um, actively involved with the Greg House in, in um, developing and maintaining a grandparent support group uh, which has been around Kim for two, three years. Um, and DCF helps facilitate that um, and funds the staff to participate in that on a weekly basis. Our bag, so one of the things that this, this community has been hit with is some recent losses, children that unfortunately that have died and, and they're young, they're newborns and we're not the only community to have this happen. But as a result of that, um, in collaboration with um, other state agencies, with other community providers, every child under the age of one that come, becomes involved with the department, the parents get a bag. It's an informational bag. It al also offers um, a warm blanket. I actually have an example of one. It's on sleeping safe. I think maybe the district attorney's office has been helpful in this. Um, you know, safe bath water, um, all the kinds of informational information, things that as new parents maybe we needed 20 years ago. Um, so all of these items, all of these things that we do as a community um, give hope to improving the lives of the families and children that are involved with DCF today. Many years ago, you would think DCF, oh, or DC, DSS, the old days, right? Uh, it was a bad thing. Um, more and more, you know, we have families involved with us on a voluntary basis. Um, more and more people are okay with saying, I'm involved with DCF, this is my worker. More and more of our workers get invited to special gatherings at their families, get in, uh, invited to dinner. Um, so that means that a partnership is developing, even though we are the protective agency um, at heart. However, again, as a larger community, we need to continue to work collaboratively to support our families and children to prevent DCF from getting involved, right? It's not really the place to go. It shouldn't be the answer. Um, but it is in many cases, and it can be a pot of positive experience, but our job as a community is to prevent that from happening, is to really embrace these families that need our help. But this is why Lynn is such an amazing community. I truly think, what I see in, com you know, in Lynn, I don't often see in many other communities, and I think you guys should be proud of that. Um, we have a faith-based community, um, not one that I have seen mirrored in anywhere else. Um, we have an amazingly committed school community, again, very large, but is always present. Um, you know, I have the luxury of being on a committee with Miss um, Crane. I don't know, I'm sure you all remember her. Um, some of you may know her, and I feel blessed to be next to her because um, she is just a powerful representation of what the Lynn Schools has to offer. And we continue to have service providers that are committed to our families. You know, I think about five, six years ago, pyramid builders moved in to Lynn um, to represent, you know, the African American and Hispanic Latino community. Um, and I think that's one of their primary service provide, you know, services. And I think that's truly amazing. You don't get that anywhere else, right? Um, Lynn Community Health. You don't, again, like Miss Barry said, you don't, you don't see that. You don't have a Lynn Community Health. 
um, in Salem, you know, and, and, you know, you might have it in Lawrence. Uh, <laughs> I do know the person that works there. So um, Children's Friend and Family, you know, one of the longest standing agencies in the North Shore that provides mental health services to our fam families and children. But on top of that, you have so, m you're so rich in regards to other community providers. Um, without our partners, we at DCF would not be able to do our job. You know, we have a great relationship with the district attorney's office. We have a great relationship with all of the other providers that we speak to with the city of Lynn. Um, without that relationship and that collaboration, we would not be as successful as we are. So just to give you a little sense of who Lynn DCF is, and we have grown. Um, I think when I last worked at DCF, we were on Wheeler Street and had no parking. Um, and I could walk here, actually. Uh, we are now on the Linway and the clock tower building, I guess. Uh, I feel like I've moved up in the world because I have parking, I have, you know, a chair, a desk. Um, so we have over 600 families involved with our office. Um, that is a lot. Um, with over 300 children in placement. That is devastating. Um, my first month there was a child, a child born exposed to substances every week that we had to remove, unfortunately. Um, I was devastated. I had never in my years had been exposed to that. Um, and I've been doing this a long time. We only have 70 social workers. However, we are looking to hire more. So Please stop stealing our staff. <laughs> I'm just teasing. You can have them. They're good. As long as they stay in Lynn. Um, we are continuing to hire. The legislature is definitely committed to the department in making a change. And without that commitment, we will not be able to make you know, positive changes. We need more workers. And we need your support with that. But the reason I tell you that number, so do the math, right? 600 families. 70 workers, but that also includes, I oversee Kim and Lori's unit, which is a home finding unit. They don't carry cases, they carry foster homes. Okay, so take those five people out. It's a lot of families for one worker. Um, our workers are tireless and committed in performing their jobs to the best of their ability. They often work nights and long days. I am really quite amazed at their dedication. Um, I am truly blessed to be working in the Lynn office. Many ask, what do you need? Like my family's like, what does DCF need? Amongst the many things that we need, we most importantly need foster homes okay. in our catchment area. So we service the Lynn, Linfield, Saugus, Nahant, and Swampscott. The other night I had four kids that needed placement, and they were adolescents. So that's our greatest need, right? Four adolescents, all four of them left our catchment area. One went, was supposed to go to Fall River. Luckily, we were able to find a one-night home for him in South Hamilton. The others went to short-term placements not a permanent situation for them. And when I say permanent, kids aren't meant to be in foster care forever. So it's just something to think about. So think about this worker that starts their day at seven, nine, eight forty-five, and then they are placing kids until 7, 8 o'clock. That's a long night for these folks. And the one woman that had to go to the farthest, Fitchburg, has a newborn at home. She's luckily, she has a supportive family. So, when you think about a successful reunification plan, how can you do that from Fitchburg, right? So our need is foster care. So on your table is this, your place card, which Pam and Lori Roscoe from the DCF office, my stellar home finder. <laughs> oh, and if you have the red, if you look on the back of your place card, if you have the red mark, you get the 
centerpiece. So hopefully that's where my banana is, <laughs> because I think that oh, those are so. So if you have the red, if you have the red mark, the centerpiece is yours. Uh, very exciting. Did everybody get one? Because if you didn't, I'll take yours. So, um, but more importantly, this is contact information on here. The other thing is there's a card, a little card for you to fill out or to take with you in photocopy, okay? And bring back to where you work, bring back to your churches, bring back to your families, have them on your coffee table um, because we need foster families. We only have a hundred or less, a little less than a hundred foster families in Lynn. And the majority of those are kinship or child specific. And that means that that child had some pre-existing relationship with that child, which is great. That's wonderful. And I'll be honest with you, we have grown our kinship foster homes tenfold in the last year and a half, thanks to Kim Wadsworth, who's our supervisor. Um, but does not mean that the need is not does not continue to be there. The other thing that's really interesting, um, we have only four families that speak Spanish only. Four. We have um, 13 homes that speak another language. That's not a lot, considering the amount of children that we place are of African American descent, or um, children of color, Latino, Cambodian. So we really need to grow our village for these children. Um, so why is foster care important and relative to today's breakfast? Foster care is about hope, right? It is about giving hope to our children that they can have a safe and nurturing sanctuary while their parents learn new skills and improve their own lives. Because no parent doesn't want to have their child with them. Foster care is a place where a child can build positive connections, learn to excel in life, and make progress. They make, the studies are proven, children that stay in their community of origin make better gains. They do well. They have less severed relationships. They make quicker bonds. They recover quicker from the trauma. Not that there's ever any real recovery from trauma, but they develop healthier. And they can also stay more connected to their families. You know, a month ago, we had to place a child out in the Berkshires. Luckily, we placed her with her grandmother. But that child's family therapy with their parent is not going to be all that productive. And it was a four-hour ride, I think it was, for the worker. So that is a day trip once a month that that worker has to go out, if not more. So it's just something to think about. Um, so lastly, I wanted to explain why I was nervous. Um, so something not many people know about me, and it's a time to really talk a little bit more. I guess Pam's, Pam, you bring this out in all of us. <laughs> uh, so um, why is the mission of DCF so important to me? I grew up as a DCF kid. So I grew up in foster care. Would you guess it? <laughs> Probably not, right? A lot of people are like, really? So I grew up in Lawrence. I was removed at the age of 11. I was considered a runaway. Back then, excuse me. Um, so back then, they placed runaways far away. So I had two foster homes, one in Billerica and one in Newburyport. So when I think of that last foster home, I think of hope. So 
I'll have to be honest, I've never actually shared this story in this forum. And actually, there's probably many people at DCF that don't even know my story. However, the reason I share that story, and I'm so passionate about foster care and about the Lynn community, is because what I see here is what I had in my foster home. I had a community. So, excuse me. Ah. Clearly, I'm not ready. <laughs> So, you know, Pam referenced heroes. So who were my heroes in my foster home? My foster mother, who was also very ill, unfortunately, but nobody knew that. But the reason I was so successful in who I am today, not only because the department put me in a foster home that really gave me hope, because I was never to return home. Um, I was eventually adopted. Um, by my foster mother, um, and, you know, and, um, but the heroes of my world today are the teachers that made sure that I went to every um, field trip, even though I didn't have the money, that made sure I was on every sport that I was interested in that asked me how my day was. The people in my community, my neighbors, who were, took me to church, my priest, um, my best friend's father, who was a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a car, but often he would pick my foster mother up and I and take us grocery shopping. You know, it was tough to move into a, from Lawrence to a very all-white community that had no diversity, um, and be then also one of the poorest families in that community. Uh, so you kind of stuck out, stood out. But I never knew that because my community embraced me, you know. And nobody ever said, "Oh, she's that foster kid," and that's why we need a community like Lynn, and why we need more foster homes because I am a product of the system, and I am a success. So, thank you. These are the moments that it all just became so clear to me on some of the struggles and some of the roads that we walked down, Michelle, that I would have never had any idea. And I applaud you immensely. I just want to focus on one thing before we turn it over to our, 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 our my most grateful guest speaker. But I just want to acknowledge um, Rick Starbod in the audience, um, Lynn School Committee, and Mr. Johnny Ford as well. Did, did I miss any of the other public officials? Because I'm so um, I'm just so caught up right now. I just I can't thank Michelle enough. Um, and these are the stories that I hear. You know, every Friday night for 15 months and long, 15 long weeks, that I'm really so hard on my families that they cannot miss one um, a class. And if they do, um, I do threaten termination because I'm committed and I want them to be committed because I want the same story from Michelle that I want for you, Lisa and Deja. This is what I want to see. I want to see you standing up here. You know, I want to pass the torch. I'm getting old for this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had the opportunity of attending many different conferences through the work of the department. I've been really blessed by that. And I went to a conference, and um, it was a conference about fathers. And I'm really entrenched these days, really trying to interact. Fathers, you know, I, I grew up here in Lynn, and my mother raised five of us on her own. I never knew the terminology or the connection of fathers. 
And so I was at this conference, Harry and I, and um, we were sitting there with chatting because Harry and I are always talking about what we can do and how big we can make it. And this video clip came on. And um, we were astonished by it. We were astonished. And Harry says to me, Pam, you have to get that clip. And I said, Harry, I'll try to do my best. <laughs> he said, who is this person? And I said, I don't know, but I'll find out, Harry. And um, I was sitting at the desk, and Harry said, you know, Pam, you got to make it big this year. It's, you know, 14 years you're getting up there. You know, what are you going to do this year? And I said, well, you know, I spoke with the mayor, and by the, the team and the partnership of Miss Kim Wadsworth and Laurie Roscoe trying to come together, wrap our heads around how do we get the message about, about foster care recruitment. And I was sitting at my desk, and I said, you know, I think I'm the, you know, the person that can do anything. I think I can get, you know, Mariah Carey to come to Lynn. <laughs> and I was sitting at my desk and I sent an email. I expected to get a secretary, an office manager, the janitor, someone. And I got a response. An actual response. And as you know, Harry probably has about 10 calls from me and I call him and I hang up because I want to speak to him. And he's like, why don't you leave a message? And I called him and I said, Harry, I emailed Mr. Sam Kaufman. You remember that video show you love? And he says, yeah, PM, did you get the video? I said, well, it costs $80. I said, can I buy it? And he says, well, well let's sit down and talk about it. I said, but Harry, I emailed Mr. Sam, Sam Kaufman. He responded back to me. <laughs> and he says, PM, come on, PM. Um, I said, no, serious. And I had to pull with the email to him <laughs> to let him know that Sam Kaufman in this work is so touching and it's compelling. It reminds me of my many conversations with Donna Capole and about Pam, you got to get these fathers involved, Pam. And um, I said, this is what Lynn needs. You know, all of our partnerships that we all talk about, this is the work we need. This is the education. This is the experience we need. So with the greatest gratitude and the greatest respect, and I cannot thank you enough. Um, I will even fork part of my budget over to you. <laughs> if you just continue to work, I, I even said to Kathy Latham, I said, Kathy, we need to sit down, we need to work with him. So may I pleasantly introduce Mr. Sam Kaufman. Um, well, all I s can say is it's very hard to follow you, Michelle. <laughs> that, that was really wonderful. Um, I, I'm here, uh, I'm a filmmaker. I make films about social issues. And um, I teach film production and filmmaking and editing at Boston University. And um, I once taught a course that I had the honor of teaching called um, The Camera as an Agent for Social Change. And I am here today because I very much believe that, that you know, films can make a difference. I've seen my films have make a difference. And the film I'm going to show you today, I think, has made a, quite a bit of difference. Um, so what happened, how it came about? I was chairman of the department, and we got a call from Vice President Gore's office. This film was made some time ago, saying they needed a film about fathers and kids. Would, would I be interested in making it? Or would someone at BU be interested in making it? And they said, you know, Tipper Gore went to Boston University. And so, so I, I said, gee, this is an opportunity to do something for the vice president's office. It's a little hard to say no, right? So I said, well, how soon do you need it? And she said, um, well, we need it for a conference in Nashville in three weeks. <laughs> Well, three weeks is a very short amount of time to make anything uh, when you don't even know that morning that you'd be doing it. So, um, so I came up with the, this idea that I would talk to kids about their relationships with their fathers. Um, that was the topic. You know, a lot of families, as we know, are, are comprised of single moms, and the father isn't part of that family. And yet, um, so given that, um, I, 
you know, there was a show, um, you know, kids do crazy stuff or whatever, but I, I really believe that children have, have a lot to say. And a lot of times we talk about them, we talk at them, but we don't listen to them. And so what I wanted this film to do is give them a chance to talk and about their experiences and about how they felt. Um, and I think that um, after I show the film, I'm going to talk a little bit about its impact and, and, and things like that, but um, I, you, you aren't really here to hear me. You're here to watch the film. I'm just the, the filmmaker, and I have so much respect for, for all the work you do, and I really feel like um, <clears throat> that it's an, such an honor to be a part of this gathering, and just I, I, I really... Um, I don't know that much about Lynn, I, 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 and now I know an awful lot. And my wife is, um, is uh, she was in education. Uh, she, um, and then she got a calling, and she went to divinity school. And now she's an Episcopal priest, and her catchment area is Fall River. And um, so, um, I think uh, when the phone call came from the vice president's office to do this film, I, I you know, she would say, "I got a call," but I felt like. I got a calling. I was called to do this film. So give me a minute to set up, just because I'm the projectionist, too. <laughs> so, um, so I just want to say that um, it's sort of following in Michelle's footsteps. Um, you know, w one of the reasons I, I decided to make this film is that, you know, when I was young, my father left us when uh, I think I was six year old. There were, there were four of us, um, and we were only like a year, a year or so apart. So he left four young children for another woman, and um, and had a new family and a child, and you know, we were basically um, history. Um, so, so I really felt like, you know, this is a topic that interested me a lot. Um, so we interviewed, you know, 17 children to make this because you never know, you know, if you're going to get anything. And this one child will, will be playing and funny and all of a sudden they sit down in front of the camera and you, you get nothing. Um, so then, you know, of the, those 17, these are the ones that, that we picked. And obviously, sometimes it's better to be lucky than and skilled, and I think the, the children that, that we happened to get really were pretty amazing. Um, the the th thing about um, being a, a child whose father leaves is obviously, you know, you can, they can, you can have other people. That's why I like the idea of, of this it takes a village approach that Lynn seems to have, is that, you know, you definitely can have other figures come into your life and make a difference. Um, and the, the, you know, the kids who were part of this film, the ones who had strong outside men, were able to do much better than those that didn't. Um, I think that, um, you know, the what's happened to these kids s since the film isn't as important in a way as what they've done through the film. I mean, this film has been used by the armed services. Um, to show soldiers that if they are going to be a father, how important that they are. It's been used in courts. A lot of times judges will show this to the warring parents so that the mother will see, wait a second, that man does have a role. He, could, he is important. Um, it's used, obviously, in um, uh, fatherhood classes, in parenting classes. Because obviously what this film does is these kids talk about how important it is to have a father f in their lives. And so what happens is men, you know, um, we aren't as good as women are at relationships. Uh, it's just a fact. And so I think a lot of times we don't think we're doing a good job, that we don't have the skills of talking with our kids, that we're not... Um, sort of as warm as, as giving as maybe the, the mother is. And so, but it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter how good you are at those things if you show your love. So one of the things that organizations do is to make that point very, very specific to the father, that your kid does love you, that you are important to him or, or her, and that 
you know, by staying away, you're hurting them and, and, and in a sense, yourself, too. I mean, it, when, when um, Malia says it, anyone can, can be a father, it takes a, a, anyone can have a child, it takes a man to be a father, I mean, I think that's really true. And I think a lot of men want to be men. They want to step up. But, but hearing from children like these makes it obviously much stronger. Um, you know, as I say, a lot of times it's the experts telling the parents. But when the children tell the parents, sometimes I think it can be a force that's more powerful. Um, I just want to uh, read you some of the organizations that have, have used this film and some of the locations just so that you can see. Um, you know, we have um, the Manitowoc uh, City Mission, um, that's in Wisconsin. We've got uh, the Down to Earth Dad in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We've got a connecting point in Wichita, Kansas. Um, we've got uh, PACT uh, in Alabama, um, Hallmark Health in, in Everett, um, the uh, so Washington, California, um, Washington, Connecticut, Florida, Arkansas, Wisconsin. I mean, you know, these kids really, you know, ha have touched a lot of people's lives. And I do think that um, talking to children, listening to children, having children um, speak is, is an important thing and to listening to them. I think too often we don't let them talk. Um, when I made this film for Vice President Gore, um, they also, at the same time, had asked Disney to do a film because they, they weren't sure how well this would turn out. And they wanted something from a, another in case, because it was a big conference they were holding in Nashville. And so, but they were very, they picked this over the Disney one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but he, um, after the success of this film, he asked me if I would do another film for them on how children view video games and television, how much of their lives are spent with video games and television. And I said no, because, I mean, how do you, that one came out so well, it's never going to be as good. <laughs> so, so he invited me down to uh, his residence in Washington and, and you know, twisted my arm. <laughs> so, um, so I did that one. And I, I think, um, you know, what was interesting about that was how many kids said that the television or their, w was their best friend you know, um, and how so much time was spent because there were safe choices uh, out on the street. Um, and then I did another film called Lessons from the Ones We Love, and it was about children and their relationship with their teachers and how important, you know, those teachers are in their lives. Um, I got a Fulbright scholarship to go to Uganda to teach, help start a television video production program at Makara University in Kampala. And as part of the Fulbright, I was asked, you know, was to do research. Well, for me, research is to make a film. So, so I did a film about children in Uganda who are HIV positive. And um, that film has done as much good in a way as this one has because people were shocked by how mistreated these children were. The stigma, you know, no one would play with them. Their families wouldn't play with them. You know, their teachers would say, you know, go home and die. You know, that kind of, because they were, you know, you people were dying. And, and so when you see, you think, how do I get it? I don't know a lot of ignorance. Um, but these kids, you know, just like these, they really spoke from the heart. So I'm a big fan of, of us involving children in their care, their service. So if there's anything that, you know, hopefully maybe you, you can take from today from, from me who's not the expert, at, 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 but, but how, how children really can, you know, enlighten you, you know. So in Uganda and most of Africa now, doctors when they treat HIV positive children, they ask them not how they're feeling first, but how are you doing? Because that mental aspect, how they are in their family, how they're being treated at home, is just as important as the medicine they're taking. Or, so, so I, I want to just say how much it, it, you know, kids can can be our instructors, um, and um, so I, I do hope that uh, today these children have 
have touched you and inspired you and and um, I do feel like I've, I've my calling to 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 take your call <laughs> and and to be a part of this has been you know really um, something that I really appreciated and uh, um, you know if you have d does anyone have any questions I'm I'm happy to to be a I just had a comment. Sure. Um, at the conference, I happened to sit at sit at a table. I don't know who was at the table. And as as the conference went on, at the end, I happened to be sitting with three women judges, uh -huh. and the three of them said that I'm going to look at fathers different now when they come to my court. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen before. So it, there really is an understanding of the importance of a father and the. Wow, thank you. It was very insightful, and I appreciate your work because I feel like generating that kind of perception and perspective is very important to parents, and especially when it comes to program implementation. And I just want to say thank you. Welcome. Yes, sir. Did this actually get made over a three-year period? Yes. <laughs> I know. You know, I called everyone I knew who had kids. <laughs> and we just dragged them in and, and interviewed them. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a place called the Dorchester, Dorchester um, Youth Collaborative. We did a lot of the filming there. Um, and, you know, just friends and so on. I'm actually in the film. I'm, I was the, the guy with the little girl, the opening shot on the beach, to, to my little daughter. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, d I do hope that, that as you say, one, one of the things that hopefully we, s we, you women in this audience who probably do feel like you do all the heavy lifting, um, you know, m maybe this, you know, seeing this film and hearing these children will just give you a little different perspective on, on the, the dual parenting role. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was announcement um, on June 13th um, the Nigerian International Humanitarian Foundation is going to have a wine and cheese dance at the Lynn Museum and Omo who um, I, I really support you know the work that she's been doing with the Nigerian women in, in our community so I would like to just announce that for her in closing in closing I thank each and every one of you. I just wanted to also just introduce um, Kim Wadsworth and Laurie Roscoe. Those are our foster care um, uh, recruitment team. And, and if you have any questions after the breakfast, if you could, you know, just approach them. Again, like Michelle said, if you have those cards, take it with you, copy it, send it over to the department. You can send it over to our office. Um, we're more than willing to support. Lastly. I just have to say that um, I'm a proud teammate of what um, recently has just unfolded here in the city of Lynn, and that's the Family Success Center. And, you know, we are so proud that the partnership that you see in that Family Success Center, we couldn't do it without the Lynn Housing Authority, we couldn't do it without Catholic Charities, we couldn't do it without the Financial Stability Center, um, North Shore Career Center, help me out, Harry. The school department, the SEMA Foundation, the school department, one of our biggest um, community connections, um, the mayor's office, the mayor's <laughs> office, <laughs> Judy, the mayor's <laughs> office. Um, all the programs, and more importantly, the parents, the community residents that come in. Um, you know, we have the veterans con office connected with us. We have the housing services. Um, just helping families find that next place to lay their head down on, you know, this homelessness is, you know, kind of out of control. And I, I just want to say, I just want to thank Harry personally for allowing me to become a partner with the Family Success Center here in Lynn and just to watch the families come in and healthy and, and smiling and the dads coming in, getting connected to jobs. And so again, I, I can't thank you enough. And I want to thank each and every one of you, my steering committee, Donna and Brian and Danielle and Brenda and Kim, 
and Mia and Loretta and Mary Ellen. Um, I, I, I just can't thank you enough. And um, you know, the public officials from coming out and lastly our panel, the mayor and Sam Kaufman and Kathy Latham, Laurie Berry, and last but not least, I mean, I'll forever I, I mean, I, I love her anyways, but I'll be forever for her just sharing that story with us. And thank you. It was the best breakfast ever. Thank you. You know, could, could we also get an applaud for my staff? We were here till 11 o'clock last night. Just, just give them. They are the best.